Thank you. you. May be seated. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Our Lord Jesus Christ is indeed our king as well as our savior and as our redeemer. Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of scripture that we read just a few moments ago over in the Gospel of John, John chapter 1, and we read verses 1 through 18. The title of the message today is The Christ of Christmas. The Christ of Christmas, our text, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. When we consider the Christ of Christmas, we must focus on two things. Number one, we must focus on his person. That tells us who he is. So the Christ of Christmas, it is determined by the person of Christ, who he really is. And secondly, the Christ of Christmas, his work. That tells us what he did, and it's all tied up in the incarnation, that moment when God stepped into human history through the virgin birth. Now, of course, both of those subjects are of an infinite scope, and so we can only partially see the blinding reflections of divine light that penetrate the eyes of our souls. And we all know the basics. You've heard me preach on them many times. Those are the elements that are revealed in the gospel of salvation. Paul speaks of that in Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Paul, the servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets, in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. There's the virgin birth. The Apostle Paul starts off with the virgin birth to open that magnificent epistle to the Romans. Paul starts, if we might say so, with the Scriptures, but you know, he mentions something immediately preceding that. He talks about what she had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. If you join us tonight for the candlelight service, we're going to be reading some of those exceedingly great and precious prophecies of the Old Testament, written thousand years, some of them, before the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the case of those famous prophecies that we know in the book of Isaiah, in chapter 7 and chapter 9, and in Micah, well, with Isaiah, we 750 to 800 years before Christ. With Micah, we're almost 500 years before Christ. Which he had promised before, in the scriptures, the Old Testament told us about the coming Messiah. It told us where he would be born. It told us that he would be born of a virgin. It told us who he would be. Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And Paul starts there. He starts, if you will, with Christmas. And declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. You know, the Apostle Paul also restates that same group of elements in the gospel, the good news of salvation, in his first epistle to the Corinthians. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. That is the good news. Here is the gospel which you all also ye have received and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. Folks, without the gospel, which focuses on the person and work of Christ, you cannot be saved. That is the only way of salvation according to Scripture. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain, was it an empty belief? There are some people with an empty belief, with a vain belief. It never reaches from their head to their heart. It misses the last 18 inches to get to salvation. That's the distance between your brain and your heart. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Those two passages, Romans chapter 1 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15, tell us who Jesus is and, two, what Jesus did for our salvation. And one of those two starts with the virgin birth. The passage that we read this morning out of the Gospel of John started with creation and portrays Jesus Christ, the one who is the Word of God, as the Creator. By Him were all things made, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of man, and the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And in verse 14 it says, And the Word, the one who was the Word in the beginning with God, the one who was the Word who made all things, 
verse 14 says, and the word was made flesh. That's the virgin birth and dwelt among us. And that word dwelt there is the word skene in Greek. It means he pitched his tabernacle. And it takes your mind back immediately to the Old Testament wilderness wanderings. And we're going through that right now in the book of Exodus. And when we get to the place where the tabernacle is built, where God rests the Shekinah glory upon it, it is a picture of Jesus. The word was made flesh and tabernacled among us. And we beheld what? Just like Israel in the Old Testament saw resting upon that goat hair tent, we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Magnificent truths concerning our salvation. Those two passages tell us who Jesus is and what he did for our salvation. That's what we have to undo and understand in order to be saved. But who he is falls into two distinct but inseparable categories. He is both perfect God and perfect man. Forever one person, he's not two persons, forever one person with two distinct natures. His undiminished, eternal, infinite, divine nature and his flawless, sinless, fully human nature. Just like who he is falls into two categories, what he did also falls into two distinct but inseparable categories. He died for our sins. You know, he had to be fully human to do that. That's why it's so important to know that he is both God and man. He's not a phantasm. He's not a Gnostic Jesus. He's not just a merely human Jesus because of the second half of the equation. But he had to be able to be perfect human to do that. He rose from the dead. That's the proof that he's God as the scriptures claim him to be. And he proposed Christ who falls short of this cannot save you from hell for all of eternity. But today I want to probe deeper into the Christ of Christmas. I want to share with you a few of the many passages that re reveal the additional purposes for which Jesus himself states that he came into the world. You know, when we think of why did Jesus come into the world, we think selfishly. We think in terms of man to save us. And that's true. But did you know that Jesus himself stated there were other purposes for which he came into the world? Did you know that the scriptures unfold a humongous number of purposes for God causing the incarnation to take place? We're only going to be able to cover a few of those this morning, but I think they're all very significant. He came into the world for additional purposes that God had besides our salvation, additional purposes for Bethlehem and the incarnation. The Christ of Christmas. Let's look at some of the other things that Jesus said he came to do at the incarnation. What did the Christ of Christmas specifically say was the purpose, his purpose at the incarnation? Number one, I hope you're taking notes. The Christ of Christmas came as the one and only ambassador from the Father. Right now we have a lot of focus on who Mr. Trump is going to be appointing his ambassadors to different places and he's appointed someone to Israel that is really pro-Jewish, he's Jewish himself, he speaks Hebrew, uh, he himself also believes that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel and so he appointed an important ambassador and that ambassador has caused some waves, that appointment has caused some waves. Why? Because there's most of the world who doesn't want to believe that Jerusalem is the capital because they hate God, they hate Israel, they're under the motivation and control of Satan, and they want to stop God's purposes and plans in the world. An ambassador from the Father. An ambassador is the chief representative of a sovereign country or kingdom to represent his country in another country. He leaves his own country and goes to that country. An ambassador is also given the specific power and authority to act in the name of his country. That's specifically a role given to Jesus. Let's look at it in several passages in the Gospel of John. John chapter 5, beginning in verse 19. Then Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. So there's perfect unity between what's going on in heaven and what's going on on earth here. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth unto him all things that himself doeth. Now look, let's look at some of the authority that is given to Jesus here. For as the Father raiseth up the dead, and quickeneth them, 
even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. Verse 22, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Here are, are qualifications and empowerments that are being given to an ambassador who's come from another country and coming into a country that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. Verse 23, He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. You know, when you don't honor an ambassador that is sent to a country, you are not honoring the country from which he came. It's a direct insult and slap in the face of the one who sent the ambassador. And that's what's happening here. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which has sent him. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. More authority. He hath given him authority to execute judgment also because he's the Son of Man. Verse 36, But I have greater witness than that of John, for the works which the Father giveth me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me. In other words, he had a stack of credentials to prove that he was the one who had been sent. Verse 37, And the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. It's very clear that Jesus understood he had been sent by the Father with specific empowerment, with specific responsibilities, with specific authority, and with a specific obligation to fulfill the will of the Father. Verse 38, And ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent, that is Jesus, him ye believe not. Here's the ambassador comes. He comes to make his presentation, and everybody's sitting there yawning and shaking their heads and going to sleep. They don't believe the ambassador. Oh, come on. I know your country's never going to attack our country. I know that everything is cool. I know we don't have to worry about you guys. That's the way they treated Jesus. You have not his word abiding in you for whom he hath sent. Ye him ye believe not. And now Jesus states one of the reasons for his coming. Verse 43. I am come in my father's name and ye receive me not. He came to represent the Father as the Father's ambassador. Look for that little phrase in each of these passages I'm going to be reading to you because Jesus says, I am come. He tells you one of the reasons why he came. Number two. Number two. The Christ of Christmas came to do his Father's will. The Christ of Christmas came to do his Father's will. That's clearly co connected to the central purpose, of course, of the gospel of salvation. But we see that also in John chapter 5, verse 30, and then down to verse 38 through 40. I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because, now here it's the purpose, I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. One of the reasons, or purposes of the incarnation, is to fulfill the will of the Father. Look down to verse 38 again. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will. This is chapter 6. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. The Christ of Christmas came to do the Father's will. Then he tells you what that is in verse 39. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me. Here he is, he's the ambassador. Why did he get sent to earth? That all which he hath given to me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. Verse 40. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. You got the Father's will stated there clearly, and Jesus clearly stating that's the reason the Father sent him. That's one of the multiple purposes for the incarnation, is to do the will of the Father. Number three, the Christ of Christmas came to fulfill the law and the prophets. The Christ of Christmas came to fulfill the law and the prophets. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you. Now here are verses that we love to pull out and look at them and say, well, this is for the inspiration of scripture. Absolutely so. 
But it's in that context of the purpose of Jesus coming into the world, the purpose of the incarnation. Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so to do, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Remember, we've got two kingdoms going on here. We've got a kingdom on earth and we've got a kingdom in heaven. We've got an ambassador from the kingdom in heaven coming down to the kingdom on earth. But whosoever shall teach and do them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness, whoa, this is a painful verse, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Whoa, that's pretty tough. Ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, I hope you see that as a rather scary statement. First of all, it makes it very clear that we cannot make it to heaven by keeping the law. There are legalists out there that say, well, you know, uh, and the rich young ruler came to Jesus, look, I kept this law, and I kept this law, and I kept this law, the Ten Commandments, lay, lay it on me, I'm, I'm good. Jesus said, okay, take all that you got, go out and sell it and give it to the poor and come and follow me. You'll have treasure in heaven. It says he went away sorrowful because he was very rich. You see, if Jesus had said to him, thou shalt not covet, he said, well, I don't covet anything. I don't need to. I've got everything. But Jesus hit him on that command, thou shalt not covet. Because you see, covetousness actually breaks the first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And the Apostle Paul tells us in Colossians 3, 5 and in Ephesians 5, 5, covetousness is idolatry and the covetous man is an idolater. And the young man, instead of doing what Jesus said to do, went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Jesus got to the point. You can't keep the law. The law is an impossible standard of perfect righteousness. That is why we had to have a Redeemer who could stand in our place and fulfill the law and the prophets on our behalf. The Bible tells us that Christ has redeemed us from, what's the word, the, the curse, that's right, the curse of the law. The law wasn't given so you could be saved. The law wasn't given so you could be sanctified. The law was given to demonstrate that you are a sinner in need of a savior. Number four. The Christ of Christmas came to preach. The Christ of Christmas came to preach. To proclaim the mandated terms for peace that were required by the heavenly kingdom to that rebellious kingdom on earth under the control of the flesh and the devil. He came bringing peace terms. He wasn't coming having negotiations. He came to proclaim peace and to offer peace terms that are unchangeable peace terms because they are the peace terms that are laid down by the victor. When there's a war, the losing kingdom must accept the conditions for peace that are offered by the victor. Some of you probably remember the famous picture of uh, Hirohito, the emperor of Japan, and MacArthur standing on the deck of the car aircraft carrier and a big table set out there and all the sailors standing at attention around them and Hirohito signing the document that brought peace between Japan and the United States. Did Japan determine the conditions for that peace treaty? No. The United States unilaterally laid down the conditions for the peace treaty. And Japan had to abide by them. The same thing is true when we're dealing with the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom on earth. Christ came to proclaim peace, and we'll see the verses for that in just a second, but it is a peace based on the heavenly mandate. This is the way it will be. You do not have an option. If you want peace with me, you must do it my way. He came to preach. That's true of the Christ of Christmas. Look at the statement of Jesus and then the theological explanation by the Apostle Paul. We find the statement of Jesus in Mark chapter 1, verses 38 and 39. And then we'll find the theological explanation by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 2. First, Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 38. 
And he said unto them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. Why did Jesus come? He came to preach. We'll find out what in a moment. And it says, And he preached in their synagogues and throughout all Galilee. And here's the war. And he cast out devils. The vicar comes in. He proclaims the peace treaty. He does a mop-up operation. You know, after World War II, there were several atolls and little islands out in the middle of the Pacific where the Japanese commanders with four or five soldiers who had been assigned to guard those atolls and islands where they hadn't heard that Japan had surrendered. And so the Allies came as they were moving through the Pacific and would land on those islands and the handful of soldiers there, still loyal to the emperor whom they thought was God, uh, they would start firing. And in one case, they said, we will only surrender if we know for sure that, that Japan has surrendered. And so one high dignitary from Japan came to the island and showed them the document that the United States had won the war and Japan had lost before they would lay down their weapons. Here we have Jesus. He's come to preach and proclaim the peace treaty that God has made. And so he's doing a mopping up operation here. He says, and he cast out devils. Now Paul explains it in Second Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. For he, that is our Lord Jesus Christ, is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, that's between Jews and Gentiles, having abolished in his flesh the incarnation. We've got the incarnation in the middle of this passage. Even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, there's the law. The law can't save you. We just saw that. Jesus said, I came to fulfill the law and the prophets. For to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross. There's another reason for the incarnation. Jesus could not have died for our sins had he not become perfect man, able to bear our sins. Do you see how closely the Christ of Christmas is tied into all these different important theological passages in the New Testament? Having slain the enmity thereby. Now verse 17, here he is preaching. And came, that is Jesus came, and preached peace to you which were far off and to them that were nigh. Number five, the Christ of Christmas came to bear witness to the truth. The Christ of Christmas came to bear witness to the truth. Truth is the hallmark of his kingdom. The incarnation was the introduction of the rightful king and to demonstrate what his kingdom will be like. John 18, 36. Jesus is speaking with Pilate and Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. we got two kingdoms going on here, folks. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Oh, art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born. He was born a king. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment, but that's, that's the incarnation. That's the virgin birth. That's Bethlehem. To this end was I born. There's Christmas. And for this cause, oh, now we're going to see the purpose. For this cause, why did Jesus come into the world? Just so he could save us? That's the only selfish view we ever look at, though it is incredibly important if you don't know that. For this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. The Christ of Christmas came to bear witness to the truth, that everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Number six. The Christ of Christmas came as light and to be light. The Christ of Christmas came as light and to be light. Now you know we've just finished an extended study on the light of the Shekinah glory in the exposition of the book of Exodus, which we're going through in the crossing of the Red Sea. And we'll see more of that as we get into the wilderness wanderings when we go a little farther. 
But light dispels darkness. Light cleanses. Light reveals wickedness. Light shows the true nature of any situation. Light gives protection from dangerous things that otherwise you cannot see. Jesus Christ came as light in a spiritually opaque and black world. Those are all the purposes for the incarnation. Every one of those things that I just mentioned, dispelling darkness and cleansing and revealing wickedness and showing the true nature of a situation and protection from dangerous things it can't see. Those are all purposes of the incarnation. They're all purposes of the Christ of Christmas. Jesus said in John 12, 46, I am come a light into the world. Why did he come? I came a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. John chapter 8, verse 12, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. John chapter 9, verse 5, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. John chapter 12, verses 35 and following, Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While ye have light, believe in the light, that you may be children of light. Do you remember where we started off in John chapter 1? with that magnificent declaration of who Jesus as the Word is. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. That is a major theme of the Gospel of John, in case you haven't picked up on that. John, uh, verse 36, while you have light, believe in the light, that you may be children of light. Oh, there's some responsibility here. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. In other words, what's it like when the light goes out, when you can't find the light, when, the, when there's darkness? Jesus has been talking about light and then it says he hides himself. He wants them to understand in practical terms. Verse 37, but though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. Some of you here today, or they're listening over the internet, may not yet have believed on Jesus. You know about him as a historical figure. You believe in him in that sense, but you haven't trusted him to be your savior and to give you light in the darkness of your life. That the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled. Oh, here we have. Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets. Listen to this. This is exciting. Which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? In other words, a lot of people are not going to believe this. Therefore they could not believe because that Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. Now verse 41. This is a specific reference back to something that occurred in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah says, In the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, and it's all capitals, all capitals means it's Jehovah, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. The pillars are shaking. The temple is filled with smoke. The angels are surrounding the throne and saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now listen to what Isaiah says here. Uh, excuse me, what Jesus, or John writing about Jesus says. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him the subject about whom John is writing is Jesus and he says Isaiah saw the glory of Jesus and he spoke about Jesus and it's a reference because he just quoted the text when he saw when Isaiah saw the glory of Jesus and spoke of him what was it In the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. The pillars are shaking. The smoke is issuing out of the temple. And all the angels, the seraphim and the cherubim, are falling down in front and saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. When Isaiah saw his glory and spake of him, John says it refers to Jesus. That's the Christ of Christmas. The one who became incarnate through the virgin birth was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. 
Oh, people. I hope you understand that's the one we're worshiping here today. That's the reason, whether it's the right date or not. It's the reason for the celebration of Christmas and the Incarnation. And Satan hates it. He's done everything he can to turn your eyes away from that. Verse 44, Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. There we go. He's the ambassador of the Father. And he that seeth me seeth him that sent me. If you want to know what the Father's like, look at me. Because I perfectly reflect him. I perfectly reflect the kingdom from which I come. I have a perfect establishment of all the things that, that are in that kingdom. I am come a light into the world. Why did he come? I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. Number seven. Our time is almost up. The Christ of Christmas came to be the Messiah of Israel. The Christ of Christmas came to be the Messiah of Israel. John chapter 1 verse 11. We read it in our text this morning. He came unto his own and his own received him not. It's just talked about him having created all of the earth. But you know, it's really interesting because in English this doesn't come out to us, but literally translated because of a switch from neuter to masculine in the Greek. The way the Greek text reads is this. He came unto his own things because he's just been talking about creation. This is something he made. It belongs to him. He came unto his own things. It's in the neuter. But then it says, and his own received him not. It switches to the masculine. His own ones received him not. The children of Israel were his special possession because he's the one who in the Shekinah glory had led them out of Egypt and sustained them for 40 years in the wilderness. He's the one who rested over the goat hair tent in that Shekinah glory. He's the one who gave them the conquest of the land. He's the one who parted the sea and parted the river. He's the one who established Jerusalem as his capital. He's the one who has promised to keep his promises to Israel as a nation and will someday rule from that, that place here on earth. He came unto his own things and his own ones received him not. He was the promised Messiah of Israel. But when he arrived, they rejected him. He was rejected by the very ones closest to the covenant promises of Israel given to Abraham. Number eight, the Christ of Christmas came to call those who would repent from their sins. The Christ of Christmas came to call those who would repent from their sins. Luke 5, 31 and 32. We're going to have to move quickly here. And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came, here's the purpose of the incarnation, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Number eight, the Christ of Christmas came to give his life. The Christ of Christmas came to give his life. John chapter 7, verses 7 through 11. Then said Jesus unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Now it is. Why did he come? What's the reason for the incarnation? I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. A lot of magnificent things that Jesus gives us insights into the incarnation. Oh, I know it goes back to the fact that God loved us and sent his son to save us. But there are a lot of other things that were accomplished in the process Things that, that make this entire diamond have all of its facets and all of the beautiful light reflected from it when we understand who he is. Number 10. Now here's one that may be difficult to understand. The Christ of Christmas came not to bring peace, but a sword. The Christ of Christmas came not to bring peace, but a sword. Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. Think not that I am come to send peace on the earth. Now, you know, if you stop just for a second, let's go back to Luke chapter 2. It's very interesting in light of the angelic proclamation at his birth, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And yet here is Jesus in Matthew chapter 10 saying, I think not that I am come to send peace on the earth. 
I came not to send peace, but a sword. Is there a contradiction in the text? Is Matthew in disagreement with what Luke said? No, there's no contradiction, because as you look at the very next few verses, it's explained in the context. Verse 35, For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, the daughter against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. In other words, if you trust Jesus, you can expect even problems with family who don't. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not up his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. In other words, there is going to be a division between those who believe, even within families, and those who do not believe. He that findeth his life shall lose it. You want to compromise to keep hanging on? Oh, you, you lose in the end. But he that loses life for my sake shall find it. He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. Here we are back again to that, that connection between the heavenly kingdom, Jesus as the ambassador, those who follow Jesus, who as we'll see in a moment are being sent out by him, and all those who stand in opposition in the kingdom of darkness. Number 11. I love this one. The Christ of Christmas I wonder if you ever thought about this. The Christ of Christmas came to destroy the works of the devil. The Christ of Christmas came to destroy the works of the devil. We think about the beautiful little baby in the manger in Bethlehem, and the farthest thing from our mind is Jesus destroying the works of the devil, but the Bible specifically says that. In fact, John, who wrote that same passage that we just read in John chapter 1, wrote three epistles and in 1 John chapter 3 verse 8 this is what he says he that committeth sin is of the devil for the devil sinneth from the beginning for this purpose the son of God was manifested that's the virgin birth and here it tells you the purpose of the virgin birth one of the many but for this purpose the son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil that's a specific statement for one of the principal reasons for the incarnation. The creation is in rebellion against the God who made it. Who was the God who made it? John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. The creation was in rebellion. It was under the authority of the devil. Jesus said, I'm the Creator. I won't put up with this. And the best way to deal with it is through the Incarnation. I will become a man and I will destroy the works of the devil. The devil tricked our first fathers, Adam and Eve. He brought them under his power. I'll become a man so that I can redeem the human beings and I will destroy the devil. That's a magnificent, powerful promise, folks. It's a fascinating verse because it ties the incarnation to military conquest. It clearly states the spiritual warfare that is raging all around us. The king first offered peace terms which were rejected. That's the purpose for the first coming. He offered peace terms which were rejected. They crucified the king. But someday he will enforce his peace terms by military victory. And he will destroy the works of the devil and cast him and his followers into the lake of fire. Revelation 19, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness doth he judge and make war. All judgment is committed under the sun. John chapter 5, we just read it. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and his head were many crowns. He had a name written which no man knew but, uh, him, but he himself. He is clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. There's the cross, and his name is called, John chapter 1, and his name is called the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word. We start with the Word at creation. We end with the Word at consummation and Jesus is declared to be the word in the middle of that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us that's the incarnation that's Christmas that's the virgin birth the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glories of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth and the armies which were in heaven followed him this is military conquest upon white horses clothed in fine linen white and clean and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword 
For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It's his word that goes out. It was his word at creation. It's his word at consummation. There's a word, there's a, a word that goes out of his mouth, the sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. That's Psalm 2. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. When you think Christmas, when you think Bethlehem, when you think the manger, when you think a baby, think King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying unto all the fowl that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast, and I saw the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse, and against his army, and the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image, these were both cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat on the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. When you remember the baby Jesus in the manger, never forget that even there in the manger, he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. A king is still a king even when he is an infant. God chose Joseph and Mary as regents to care for the king until he could make his offer of the kingdom to Israel and then to the world. The offer was rejected, but he is still the king. And someday he will come again from the far country of which he gave in the parables and claim his kingdom and crown with power and great glory. Number 12. The Christ of Christmas came to send you. The Christ of Christmas came to send you. You see, you belong to the king. When the king speaks, you must obey. This is perhaps the most ignored part of the Christmas story. There is no room for excuses. You have been given his message to the rebellious world around you, the kingdom that's in rebellion. You have been empowered as his servants by the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. You have commissioned from him as his soldiers. The Christ of Christmas is your Lord and Master. He must be obeyed. John 20, verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, What was he declaring? Remember? What was the message? Peace. The angels announced peace. Jesus said, There's going to be a war in the middle. I came not to send peace but a sword. But now Jesus is declaring peace to his followers. Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Here we have it. This is the message. Peace be unto you. But it's on God's terms, not your terms. God's terms, not the world's terms. God's terms, not the devil's terms. God's terms, not the flesh's terms. Peace be unto you. Now listen to the next words. Remember we talked about, number one, Jesus was the ambassador sent by the Father. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. That's part of the Christmas message. We started the message with Jesus being sent at Christmas as the ambassador from the Father. We end it with Jesus sending us as his ambassadors to carry his message. With that comes the specific power and authority of the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. We can expect the same treatment that the world gave to Jesus, but that does not change the fact that he is still King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah! And we sing that at Christmas. And he shall reign forever and ever. And then, hallelujah, hallelujah. Man, it's magnificent. From creation to consummation, Jesus is the King.
He'll reign forever and ever. Don't miss the point. We have our commission stated in Acts 1, verses 6 through 11. When they therefore were come again, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou this time restore the kingdom again to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for me, for you to know the times or the seasons. In other words, it's not a wrong question, but I'm not going to tell you when it is. It will happen. You will, God will restore the kingdom to Israel, which the Father hath put in his own power, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, because, see, Jesus had another plan. He was going to send us as his ambassadors. We just talked about it. And you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing into heaven? In other words, get on with what he told you to do. Don't stand around and stare up at the sky. This same Jesus... This same Jesus, not a different Jesus, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. We just talked about that. King of kings and Lord of lords, he'll defeat the Antichrist. He'll defeat his enemies. He will destroy the works of the devil. As you bow before the Christ of Christmas, as did the shepherds and the wise men so long ago, remember what you are actually doing you are giving worship to the God of heaven. You are submitting yourself, body, soul, and spirit to the King of kings and Lord of lords. You are reverberating through all of your being that you are his servants, his children, his bride, his church, his ambassadors, his soldiers. And you're stating before the watching world that you understand that he has called you to obey. To rely on his Holy Spirit for empowerment. To carry his message into the darkness. To engage in spiritual warfare. To proclaim that the king is coming. And you state clearly and without compromise that all the world must bow before him. For he is the king. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is the King. That's the Christ of Christmas whom we worship today. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power, for its interconnectedness, for the way in which it infallibly leads us and is inerrant in its inspiration. Father, how we thank you that it is complete. It tells us what we need to know about the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the center of your word, the one who loved us, who came to earth and died for our sins, and how we thank you for that. But how many more things as we view the purposes that Jesus himself stated were purposes that he had in coming into this world. Purposes for the incarnation, purposes for the manger, purposes for Bethlehem, purposes for Mary and Joseph, through whom you allowed him to be raised, so that he could accomplish that which you had sent him to do. He came to do your will, and he perfectly fulfilled it. Father, you've given to us your indwelling Holy Spirit, and you've called us to do your will. You've called us to obey. We pray for wisdom, because you promised in your word that if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him, but let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is as a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Father, we ask for wisdom, not merely so we can manipulate others. We ask for wisdom so that, like Jesus, we will do the will of him who sent us. We thank you for the Christ of Christmas. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn for today is hymn number 2.